Thank you. It is my pleasure to welcome the 3IE, 3IE Board of Commissioners, 3IE members, friends of 3IE, our colleagues in international development and evaluation to the second annual 3IE Howard White Lecture. We established this lecture last year in Howard's honor and we had the inaugural lecture in London during our first 3IE London Evidence Week. Our speaker was Howard himself. This year, in trying to fill those very large shoes, we set some conditions that we would try to meet in finding the right type of speaker who could embody all that Howard um, shows us in his leadership, his expertise, and his innovation. We look for speakers who have real passion for evidence-informed decision-making, for development that delivers value and actually helps poor people's lives improve. We look for speakers that embody leadership, who look at things and say we can make them better, have ideas and can convince others about the type of change that we need, that we can make our work better, and that we can deliver better results. Howard believes that we are all responsible for making development work better, for the money invested, and that outcomes do improve everyone's lives. As he demonstrates every day, he wants us to take that passion and apply it in our work. He asks us to question and to challenge, and to challenge the orthodoxy of development and of evaluation, and to dare to be different. We envision the annual Howard White Lecture as becoming a reference point in the ongoing dialogue on increasing evidence-informed decision-making and development and the role of impact evaluation and evidence synthesis in improving development effectiveness. And I would now like to turn the program over to Richard Manning, Chair of the 3IE Board of Commissioners. Thank you very much, Beryl, for that excellent introduction. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Deborah Rugg. We're extremely pleased, Deborah, to have you with us to follow Howard's own lecture. And it's always, when you set up a series, getting the second thing right is almost as important as anything else. Um, and um, because you do, as I've, I've seen from your CV, which I hope everybody's now read, uh, it, that you've done a, a fantastic career in exposing, being exposed to some very interesting, difficult political challenges and trying to show that evaluation can really make a difference while you do that. And uh, Deborah brings enormous and diverse experience to, of bringing solidly based evidence into crucial policy spheres. I suppose for much of your career, particularly in the areas of health and HIV AIDS, where you did enormously important work, not least in the early years of the epidemic when people were not understanding what the issue was and how to bring evidence to bear in a, a politically highly contested space. And I think that one thing that, that Howard's always impressed on everybody is that we're not here to, in 3IE to produce studies, we're here to change the world. And I think that your experience in trying to use evidence to do exactly that is going to be extremely um, useful and material to us. But Deborah's got a, another experience which uh, is almost unique, which is trying to bring together the entire evaluation resources, the whole UN system. Uh, I think you were dealing with uh, 40 different agencies at least in, uh, in this endeavor. And that's a pretty uh, awesome task for anybody to undertake. And I'm sure there's lots of uh, interesting lessons to be learned from that, and I, I can't imagine some of the behind-the-scenes uh, activity that's necessary to try and get that very large super tank appointed in the same direction. Not content with that, uh, at the end of last year, uh, Deborah was uh, very largely responsible for the UN General Assembly passing the first ever resolution in its history on the subject of evaluation. That's no mean task. We're here in 2015, in the year of evaluation, that year itself, the, the announcement of that year, is itself very much a tribute to, to Deborah's influence in driving things forward. And of course, the year of evaluation is also the year in which the world is setting itself new objectives from here to, to 2030. And thinking about how all of us involved in evaluation can make a real contribution in that space is something that's very important. And I hope that uh, 
Deborah can maybe help us a little bit with understanding what lay behind this achievement of getting all these things onto the public domain. So it's just a fantastic opportunity to hear Deborah's reflections on 35 years of grappling with some of evaluation's greatest challenges, and not least how to, to turn that into something that makes a real policy difference. We're ex also extremely privileged by the fact that uh, Deborah has, has just in, a, in the last few days stepped down from her role at the UN, so she can thus tell us how it really is. So <laughs> without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Deborah Rugg as our 2015 Howard White Lecturer. Good evening, colleagues. Thank you, Richard, for those very, very kind, kind opening remarks and introduction. Uh, it does give me incredible pleasure to be here today. In preparing for this, one of the first things I did was go on YouTube and look up Howard White keynote address and watched, and I'm not sure it was a good idea to do because he spoke for 45 minutes eloquently, inspirationally, without notes, without taking a breath, and I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> What have I said yes to? How can I follow in his footsteps? He is definitely a hard act to follow. So I will endeavor to do something similar today, but I hope I can do at least half as well as he did in providing you with some insights and provoking your thinking and uh, sharing some experiences over an equally long career. Um, as, as Richard said, it is extremely exciting for me. This is the first time in 35 years I've been able to speak without a big agency clearance process hanging over my head. 20 years with the United States government, 10 years with the United Nations. Every time I wanted to speak publicly, I had to have my talks cleared. Every time I wanted to speak candidly, it had to be off the record or I had to go back to the office on Monday and worry about the consequences of having spoke too frankly or too boldly. So today, all bets are off. I get to just speak. I have a 15-page uh, talk that I won't read from because I don't have to. <laughs> So, um, so hopefully we're, we're all in for a treat. Uh, who knows what's going to come off uh, out of my head as I start to feel this liberation of speaking um, freely. Uh, but I will focus on the use of evaluation, something dear to my heart, something I think is, is extremely current and we've got to get better at. And I won't just talk about successes. As you know, agencies love to tell success stories. I was charged with talking about successes for years. I don't have to do that anymore. I can talk about failures, and I can talk about how silly we were, how naive, and the things that we learned from those failures. I think most importantly, the value of a failure um, is to learn and not repeat it again. So um, I'll share some of those failures and some of our successes along the way. Um, the first area then I would like to talk about are the experiences I had starting out at CDC, uh, fighting the AIDS epidemic, or I should say fighting fear, hysteria, misperception, stigma, and discrimination that was fueling the AIDS epidemic in the early days. And an interesting fact to know, it actually took CDC 17 years of the epidemic to establish a program evaluation branch that was doing proper outcome and impact evaluation. Prior to that, the response was the sole bastion of medical epidemiology at the CDC, where with 10,000 employees, 7,000 were medical epidemiologists. So it took us 17 years to get proper program evaluation, and also the behavioral and social sciences finally took, took root and found a home there. But I also attribute some of our early failures to not having that breadth of disciplinary, multidisciplinary background at the CDC, which was the agency charged with um, understanding, preventing, controlling the epidemic um, in those early days. What I'd like to talk about is my experience evaluating our communication campaign and my experience evaluating adolescent-based um, HIV prevention interventions. So first of all, <clears throat> the first charge of CDC was to educate the public when the uh, HIV epidemic was, was understood. I actually was involved in treating the first case of HIV in San Francisco in 1981. So it's a, a real uh, process for me to, to watch where it came uh, and where, where it went. Um, and it's really a treat to look back and to take stock of some of the things we thought we knew and, and how wrong we were. 
Uh, the first campaign in, a, in the US was called America Responds to AIDS. And frankly, it was one of the most bland, um, uh, vague, uh, veiled in innuendo, um, easily missable campaigns I think I've ever seen. It was uh, something that could, um, it, it was our response to trying to deal with this sensitive, politically sensitive um, issue and to try to get information out to the public, the, the entire population. But it didn't have any specific information whatsoever about the disease, and certainly nothing about what you could do specifically to protect yourself from it. So it failed, and, but our thought at the time was that this, this communication campaign would educate the public, and of course, human beings being rational will understand that, uh, protect themselves, and that would therefore control the epidemic, and we would be out of that situation within a couple of years. And history shows all of that to be really naive and wrong. Um, all it did was feel hysteria and fear, and those truly at risk didn't get the information they needed at all. Interestingly, the same thing was happening in countries around the world. By contrast, in Australia, they decided to, to take a very different approach and use a dramatic scare tactic. They, in fact, wanted to scare people to death, and if any of you saw those early videos, they used the Grim Reaper, the symbol of death, to be the face of the AIDS campaign in Australia, where the message on this, uh, this actual Grim Reaper on the video was that there's something out there and it's going to kill you. But nothing about the disease and nothing specifically what this meant. So, of course, if you know risk perception and prevention, um, if you raise people's concern way beyond any uh, um, uh, ability to act on it with no specific information, you raise anxiety, people just get more afraid and paralyzed and ignore, and that's exactly what happened. A lot of people putting their head in the sand. So their campaign neither uh, also did not provide specifics, um, and, it, and our evaluations were showing this. It took several years for the evaluation results to finally um, incorporate into better messaging. Um, but even when we started to employ social marketing experts, our messages got better, but still our distribution channels and how widely they were disseminated um, did not improve. Because the climate itself still had not changed enough for us to be able to talk about AIDS and sex frankly, specifically about what needed to be done, about condoms, about drug use, about marginalized populations and men who have sex with men. We still couldn't publicly address these issues. So what we realized we needed to do was start to tailor, segment, and focus um, a more specific approach to communication campaigns, which we finally were able to do. And once we did that, we started to turn the tide. So we learned that we had to scale back, going after a national population-based approach. We, we were just hitting our head against the walls. And when we started to take a more granular approach, we started to get much more effect. So we, we focused on types of risks, risk groups, targeted messages, and did not uh, try for national campaigns. We looked at state, district, and community-based approaches in order to deal with the context. This is where I started to see, which I'll see over and over for many decades of my life, that context is essential. It's the starting place. It's where you carry out um, throughout your, your evaluations, um, your, your insights come from, and it's in the end what is influencing you. So context is always, always important. So these barriers and lessons learned were expanded dramatically when it came to AIDS, sex, and young people. But being the, the martyr I am, I jumped right into that, completely naive, all ambitious, and full of passion to help young people protect themselves and to avoid this disease, which was all completely preventable. We started doing adolescent uh, school-based education. We worked with solid uh, prevention interventions, developed a comprehensive approach, life skills approach. Uh, we were doing rigorous randomized trials. We had the, the best results that were coming out of the prevention intervention research at that time. Um, we started then doing research synthesis, analyzing all the literature first in the U.S. and then adding the international literature base about what does and doesn't work and what the effects of sex and AIDS education were on young people. The conclusions were absolutely clear. I think the most clear conclusions I've ever seen in, in my research in, in HIV prevention and since then, sex and AIDS education was extremely 
valuable to middle and high school students. It did not um, increase the number of sexual partners. It actually delayed sexual debut. It increased contraception at first intercourse. It reduced the number of unwanted pregnancies and STDs and facilitated adolescents longer, uh, staying in school longer. So this information was also taken on uh, by the highest technical body in, in our country, the National Institutes of Health, and they convened one of their high think tank bodies called uh, Scientific Consensus Conference on adolescent uh, sexual interventions and AIDS prevention. So they invited um, all the experts and the international experts, and they came to a conclusion, and they put out public statements that, in fact, AIDS and sex education were extremely valuable to, to young people and should be um, uh, focused on comprehensive interventions and get underway. Very shortly after that, I think no more than a week, the U.S. administration enacted legislation curtailing federal funding for sex and AIDS education that did not present an abstinence-only message, which had no research, no evidence whatsoever of effectiveness at that time. Interesting to note, this restrictive policy found its way into later years into the PEPFAR initiative, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS re Relief, where policies enforced uh, countries receiving U.S. government money that there were strings attached in the prevention arena for adolescents. In fact, they could only receive money if they had a prevention, uh, an abstinence-only prevention message. Well, when this money went to Brazil, uh, they had a very difficult time with that because Brazil had a long-standing history of comprehensive school-based education already. So essentially, Brazil said no and gave the money back. Other countries started to follow suit, though not near enough. Ad additionally, more recently, Nathan Lowe at Stanford won an award for research showing that the $1.2 billion spent by PEPFAR over 10 years in Africa for prevention and uh, abstinence-only interventions has had no measurable effect. So talk about politics, uh, the relation of, uh, with science and values and, and public will. Uh, I had up close and personal experience with some of these uh, issues, facing them directly uh, head on. So this was very frustrating for educators and evaluators and health officials and activists everywhere around the world. After many debates about what could be done, I decided to drop back and start talking to U.S. congressmen and maybe more importantly, to their staffers. So I told them our evidence was as strong as it was ever gonna get, and we just weren't seeing policy changes that were needed. What could we do? So they said, okay, let me give you some tips. And here's what they said. First of all, we do get a lot of good information from you, but it's really too complicated, and we're really not understanding it. So you need to make it simple, because it's simply not simple enough. So prepare some simple persuasive policy briefs for us in addition to those long comprehensive evaluation reports you send us. Second, they said the evaluation findings seem to talk about very small differences, fractions of percents and small numbers and 1% and, uh, population this and, and changes that seem to be splitting hairs to us. You need to give us compelling findings, things that grab people's attentions, things that our congressmen can take to their constituents and say, this is really important. 75% of the young people in our district have already had sex. Half of them aren't protecting themselves. This intervention has zero effects. This one is reaching th a third or a fourth. Numbers that were compelling, because if it's not compelling, frankly, to get busy people's attention, um, it's just not gonna pay off. So we had to drop back and think about what would be more compelling um, and what would make a difference. Of course, not going beyond data, but figuring out how to package, what to emphasize. Third, they said it needs to be more salient. And by that they meant timely. Many times evaluation reports come into us as policymakers, politicians, or decision makers, and it's long after we've finished talking about the topic. If the decisions have been made, the resource plan set, legislation enacted, and the report comes in the next day, it will have no effect. So you need to get the information in when people actually need it, when they want it, and can do something about it. That we need to work on a whole lot more because I think we really, as evaluators, don't pay enough attention to that. But then they said, finally, truth be told, this is off the record, but it's, it's very much true what you're going to deal with, is that if the findings are not consistent with the prevailing attitudes and values 
of our constituents, we're going to have a very difficult time acting on those findings. And this was really disappointing to a lot of my technical colleagues, you know, throwing their hands up, what are we going to do? But for some of us, we realized, well, if one thing is consistent about politics, it's that it's never unanimous, and that there are always politicians and policymakers who disagree. So the task here is actually to find those who are more like-minded with your ideas. This requires more work. You can't just go to the policy board, the legislation, the, par the parliamentarians, and blanket them with findings. You've got to do some background homework, find those who might be like-minded, and work with them to give information they can actually use. So we sought out states, districts, and community planning groups who were poised to make policy and take action with the findings on adolescent-based um, research. So this was a big lesson for us after many years trying to get a national prevention policy for young people. We learned that we needed to start at a more granular level. Now I'd like to turn on some examples working with national governments around the world when I was working at UNAIDS in Geneva. We were involved in a variety of activities uh, there. I was there six years. We started out establishing the Monitoring and Evaluation uh, Resident Field Advisor Program, where we had 65, 70 ME advisors uh, in countries and regional offices. These ME advisors were to work half-time in the national governments, and the resident advisors were in the UNAIDS regional support teams. They were to cover countries that didn't have a country advisor in terms of supporting their monitoring evaluation. And of course, in those days, it was a big M and a very little E, and many times we would hear, where's the E in M and E, because it was so dominated by the monitoring. Um, again, coming from the epidemiology and the demography and the indicator tyranny uh, that we all experienced in those days, which were easy, things that were easy to count, tabulate, aggregate, report. So very little uh, E. But we did, um, we were the leaders of the global response um, uh, reporting system at UNAIDS. We tracked the global UNGAS indicators and the global MDG indicators and established the uh, premier uh, AIDS global database and its reporting uh, systems that was country level and global level. We st established when I was chairing the uh, HIV m &E reference group for those six years, um, a process to look at indicators. At that point, there were over 400 AIDS indicators that were coming to the national AIDS programs and councils. And sometimes it would be just one person in the national program with 18 different manuals in front of them looking at all of the indicators being required by the bank and PEPFAR and DFID and UNICEF and, and WHO and trying to figure out how they were going to find the data and the information to report on that indicator. And those indicators were similar, but not the same. And if you know the world of indicator reporting, a similar indicator is a real headache. Uh, like, uh, there couldn't be more ways to measure condom use, I found over those years. Condom use at last sex, condom use last year, casual partners, not casual partners, et cetera, et cetera. Um, time frames, recall periods. All, everyone had a different take on what kind of measure they wanted because they really didn't work to synthesize anything before they began. They went in a room like this, sat down at a table, and brainstormed what they wanted to measure, and off it went. And every agency was doing the same thing. So at that point, there were 18 manuals coming from the donors and over 400 indicators. So that just was a um, completely uh, overwhelming task. The capacity in the government's uh, national program's not there, and we felt it needed to stop. So UNAIDS led a process to coordinate the donors, reduce the indicators, and listen for the first time to national government's information needs and what they wanted to know, what help they needed, and what would be doable. This dialogue was facilitated by our resident advisors, our ME advisors in country, who were establishing good relationships, again, spending half time in the government, and acquiring trust. This was a genuine engagement with countries. We worked with ministries, parliaments, and increasingly with civil society to better respond to their needs. So the result was, in the end, coming up with 25 UNGAS, which is the UN General Assembly Special Session on AIDS from 2000 and to, renewed in 2006. Those UNGAS indicators were 25. And then after a process with the countries, we identified 15 additional for a total of 40 indicators. Uh, and those 15 additional were based on context. So 40 was a far cry from over 400. We gained enormous uh, support and credit from national programs for doing that. And this is where we started to embrace what I call a quid pro quo 
mindset. Quid pro quo, you give, you get. So we made good on a promise to reduce aborted, reporting burden, and countries started to report more completely, more timely, more accurately, and free up time on their part to start thinking about evaluation and key questions they actually wanted to know answers to and the ability to start asking evaluations to be done. Because frankly, the indicator world had totally dominated the whole m and &E world that was for everybody, whether you were a district manager, um, a state hospital director, a national aids program director, it was monitoring indicators and reporting. PEPFAR estimated 95% of their m and &E officer time is on planning and reporting on indicators, and it had gotten way, way out of control. So focusing on this reduction was a big breakthrough. In the end, when I left, um, we had started out with 103 countries reporting, and when I left, 185 of the 192 member states were actually reporting on time with uh, much more complete data. And some of them actually starting a new process in national evaluation policy for HIV had begun. National policy was also part of this with the National Composite Policy Index, and here again we were making breakthroughs because we didn't just want to know about government's perspective, we wanted to know about civil society's perspective as well, of what was really going on in prevention, what was making differences in the communities. So we invited them to have a voice in the reporting process and invited them to, to prepare shadow reports. Those shadow reports sometimes were integrated right into the, the national report on AIDS. For example, I remember Kenya doing a very, uh, being very much a leader in this regard where the actual report um, would have the government's response and in shadow text right after it, civil society's um, opinion on that issue of uh, treatment for mother to child transmission or how the outreach was working. So it was actually integrated. Others had two separate reports. But nonetheless, these shadow reports started to increase the dialogue in country and started to uh, uh, facilitate reform. Sometimes, however, global pressure was still needed, especially when the issues were about violations of human rights. Another final lesson here for us was that you really, really have to understand that this is all fragile. Any success I'm talking about, any success you need, make needs continued attention. And if you turn your, your mind away from it, it will relapse, it will go back again. So until it's really established, it's like any individual behavior we have, quitting smoking or starting exercise or acquiring something new, you have to main, you have maintenance and support. So these systems were fragile. I'd like to end my experiences uh, before summing up some lessons for you by describing then my recent experiences um, as the Inspection and Evaluation Director in the Office of Internal Oversight at the UN Headquarters in the Secretariat in New York, where I report to the Secretary General and work with many of the member states directly. I'd like to give um, two examples, one about our evaluations of UN peacekeeping operations and then talk a little bit about the resolution that, that Richard talked about. So our job in the Inspection Evaluation Unit is to evaluate 33 UN Secretariat programs, including the $8 billion a year UN peacekeeping operations. But our range of programs that we evaluate run from UN Drugs and Crime to UN um, High Commission for Refugees to UN Humanitarian Coordination to the Environment to Habitat. Um, et cetera. So we have quite a broad uh, scope. Our evaluations focus on relevance, efficiency, effectiveness, and sometimes impact. Impact's very difficult to achieve in the UN, even more difficult to measure, but where we can, we try to do it. So in the peacekeeping arena, we do three to four studies a year, and Af and we start out with a risk-based planning every year to decide what is the greatest risk to the UN and where should we focus our limited resources each year. It's interesting to note for me that I have, uh, you know, I have 26 staff and only three of those are funded by the uh, account that supports peacekeeping evaluation. So three people to do an $8 billion program evaluation process. So if you think you're struggling in an area, <laughs> peacekeeping is definitely an area struggling with uh, evaluation. Um, so, on, on, and we did, we also just finished a study, um, well, we finished two studies on the protection of civilians, or I should say the failure to protect civilians in conflict situations, and the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse among peacekeepers. But I only have time today for one of these, so I'm going to focus on the recent study of the failure to protect civilians. 
Um, here we looked, there are, in, in the protection of civilians, as many people have some exposure to, um, the UN typically is not engaging in using force in, in civil conflicts. But in fact, there is a mandate and the potential for them to have a, a variety of, of interventions. They can work on diplomacy, they can work on engagement uh, without force, and they can actually use force to protect civilians who are in life-threatening situations. So we sat down and uh, examined what was really going on, first checking the data, understanding the situation, doing site visits and document reviews, incident reporting. And then we set out to do an outcome evaluation of this issue to see if the changes that they had been um, trying to make were actually making a difference. More interventions that were actually reducing the uh, situation of, of civilian uh, incidents, uh, a failure to protect civilian in incidents. Uh, so what we found, was that, in fact, the, there was a lot of progress on the, issue, on the areas of uh, diplomacy and engaging without force and, and uh, taking action after situations, but the middle link in this five-component chain was broken, that our troops simply were not intervening and using force when civilians were at risk of, of life, uh, life and limb. So, I don't have time to go in more details of that. What I really want to talk about is what happened. What happened? How did this, how did this finding um, get used in the UN? Well, the first thing we did was immediately start diffusing the findings uh, as soon as they were in. We started talking to the program managers, the Department of Peacekeeping Operation Directors and, and Mission uh, Commanders to let them know what we were finding, to make sure they understood it, that it was simple but not too simple. We didn't want to appear naive in this highly complex and, and nuanced arena, and that it was coming in at a timely way when they could discuss it. Then, we, then after that, we shared it with the member states. All of our evaluations go through an intergovernmental member state process where they review the reports and decide what recommendations they want to go forward and what they want to see acted on. And this is what uh, we then next took a step on. We have got immediate resistance, immediate strong resistance from member states, especially the troop contributing nations, and senior peacekeeping officials. However, we also had member states who welcomed it and peacekeeping officials who welcomed it. So we jumped into the heated debate and dialogue about what can be done. This was clearly a long-standing problem, a political problem, and a complicated problem. But the, dial but the results and the discussion started to have more and more impact. It found its way into the European press. It found its way into the New York Times. It found its way to the Brookings Institute here in Washington for policy. And it found its way to the Secretary General who called together senior executives and said, this can't go on, this is huge risk for us, what are we going to do about it? So this led to a call for a high-level external panel that has also um, just finished, looked at other UN peacekeeping reforms, that's also just finished and their recommendations are in. Both their panel and our study are calling for reform in the protection of civilians. This will not be easy. The discussion is now underway in the Security Council. It will take time, but it is happening. Um, so stay tuned. I hope that there's a, a noticeable change in policy uh, over time and that we can report back in, in some time that that actually has made a difference at the more impact level. So I would then like to end the experiences to talk, and, and some of you have asked me to talk about the resolution and what it took to uh, achieve a resolution for the first time in the UN, a, a really a political process, and it was quite a learning experience. I had not ever done that kind of uh, advocacy work before. Um, you know, the UN has uh, 192 member states. We were working to find champions. It took almost two years to do this process. In the end, we had 42 countries stand up and become active co-sponsors of the resolution. And when it went to the General Assembly for vote on the 19th of December, there was a consensus, a unanimous consensus um, by all member states that there would be a res this resolution would go forward. So how did we do that? Um, there was a few points, and it, it seemed like it was going nowhere fast. Um, there were times it was t a total roller coaster, and we were sure that it was dead in the water. In fact, in the member state parlance, when they do resolutions, they like to kill things. We're going to kill that resolution. I can't tell you how many times one side or the other, and it did get polarized, surprisingly, um, said we're going to kill this resolution. And we would walk out of a room, and <laughs> it would seem like, in fact, it had died. 
Um, and you can imagine how depressing that was that night. But then we'd start getting 2 a.m. emails that needed a response by 5 a.m. because there was a breakfast meeting where they were going to try to resuscitate it again. So, so we said, okay, we'll play your silly game, and we engaged. And um, it was, it you know, wasn't a rational, method methodical approach. It was politics. Um, and it was about trust. It was about building trust among member states and slowly and repeating a clear, consistent message over and over and over, sometimes to the same group of people, sometimes to a different group of people. But we finally got one ambassador to stand up and say, I'm going to table this resolution, and he started the ball rolling. He got his colleagues on board. It actually was from Asia Pacific, the ambassador of Fiji. So let that be a lesson that small is powerful. And interestingly, a side note for me, it seems to me that evaluation, because these small island states are like the canary in the minefield when it comes to the global impact, they want to know actually what is making a difference. They have a, a gut need to know what's going to happen to us in the future, what might work, what doesn't work. They don't want to just sit back passively and watch the, st the statistics come in as they lose their boundaries and the, the climate changes. So, he immediately got the other small island states in the whole region to join in. And then we went for multi-regional. And we, in fact, got uh, countries from every region in the world joining in and standing up and signing the declaration. Um, so that, that was a breakthrough. And that was a real lesson that it's really true that it only takes one person to start change. I, I can't believe how that adage was just so, so powerfully true. Um, and that it be such a small country was really, really inspiring. Um, but in this process, then we found common ground, and I watched the politics, the pure politics of North and South and, and regions play out. Our topic was held hostage um, to other issues that did, had nothing to do with evaluation. You know, these member states were in committee meetings hour after hour every day, and our topic would be on the agenda at three. Well, this group of people had been arguing and fighting in opposite sides for four hours already, and then they come in to find consensus on our topic. Many times um, we suffered <laughs> from that. But in the end, learning that process, then we did a lot of homework and were able to get, um, get, it, get it through. So what evaluators learned is that we can learn how to partner with politicians, um, but we have to step outside our comfort zone. And I often advise people to try to do that about 10% of your time every day. Like, do something really different and you're not comfortable with, um, just to keep exercising that ability, just like exercising muscles. Step outside your mental comfort zone, learn something new. In doing that, we found a common ground. And then in a common ground, we could get agreement and move forward um, a first ever uh, initiative that would have far-reaching effects. So I can tell you already some of those effects um, in the UN are that we are becoming now for the first time much more strategic as UN evaluation heads. I chair the UN evaluation group, or I did until I stepped down last week. Um, uh, Marco Sagoni at UN Women now chairs it. Uh, and for the first time I'm watching this group of 45 evaluation directors start to talk about strategy and advocacy and who's going to do that now that Deborah's gone? And did we really learn what to do? And um, I'm really pleased to say that uh, a handful of people are picking it up. So you'll see more strategy. But importantly, not just in getting the evaluation function on the agenda, we're getting evaluation into the SDGs. We've been trying hard on that. You'll see UN documents, and it'll be all about monitoring, all about an accountability framework. These words are politically charged, so we can't use the word um, accountability anymore, for example. It's about program reviews, and then we couldn't use program reviews, um, and then we couldn't use monitoring. But whatever they're going to end up calling it without it being politically charged, it's going to have to be decided by September. Um, and in those words that they will call this, uh, there's going to be the evaluative function. All of our UN aides, uh, our UNEG uh, evaluation directors, are going to have sector SDG events. So the food-based agencies, the Rome-based agencies, and goal two about food security in November will come together to start to embrace um, the evaluability of the indicators in, in their area. And we're encouraging all the sectors, all the goals, and the evaluators to come together to do the same thing. Because we really do want to show that evaluation has a benefit and that it has its rightful place in the sustainable development goals era so that we can achieve the world we want and dignity, uh, a life of dignity for all. Because as the Secretary General has said, evaluation is not easy and it's not popular, 
but in these budgetary constraint times, it's more essential now than ever. So those are my experiences to share, from which I've, I've gleaned a number of interesting lessons and tips I'd like to pass on to you and try to do that quickly, because uh, <laughs> I know I've talked a bit about the experiences. Let me, let me focus then on, um, I have 12 tips. I'll, I'll go through them uh, pretty directly. The first thing I recommend doing is about engagement with the stakeholders and starting out with three simple questions. I always begin with these questions because in my experience, it really works well for non-evaluators. And these questions are, are we doing the right things? Are we doing those things right? And are we doing them on a scale that's actually making a difference? Those questions encompass all of the types of evaluation we do. Are we doing the right things? This is about effectiveness, outcome research, and effectiveness, and research synthesis. Should we be doing school-based interventions, or should we be doing uh, community work? Are our strategies for, for development and, and uh, education working, or should we be doing something else? So that's the first question. Clearly the issue of quality, because it doesn't matter if you have an effective intervention, but you're not implementing with fidelity. It won't work. So the issue of process evaluation, quality assessments, implementation assessments, absolutely essential. Um, but the most important is probably the last one, and that's are we, doing the, are we doing these interventions on the scale that's actually making a difference, the issue of coverage and impact, and this is where 3IE can play an uh, even stronger role, and you've, you've done really, really well to date. But these questions do resonate, and it helps uh, policymakers start to value and appreciate the purpose of evaluation, and to distinguish it a bit from other disciplines, like audit. I sit in an, a department that has an audit division, an investigation division, and an inspection and evaluation division, and I'm constantly confused with audit. And it's a very hard thing to distinguish, and people really just want to see you as an auditor. So these kind of questions of, well, don't you want to know if, if this is actually making a difference? Are we doing the right thing? Should we change? Can an auditor tell you that? No, no, they can't. They can talk about compliance when we know what we should do, and they can check off whether or not we're doing those things. Um, second, I think we need a much better uh, focus on the pre-evaluation process. So, you know, decades ago, Michael Quinn Patton, or Michael Patton as he likes to be called now, told us the first step in any evaluation is stakeholder involvement, stakeholder engagement. This is what we have to do fully, better, and without fail. I, in our evaluations, we spend about three months, a 90-day scoping period, where we talk to the program managers and get their engagement and understand potential future trigger points that could uh, enhance use. So maybe this program has an international board meeting um, in nine months. We work really hard to say, what can we get into that decision-making process by the nine-month mark? So that we actually are thinking ahead. And then if we're working with evaluators who really think an evaluation should take three, three months and we were thinking three years, well, we've got to find common ground there. We've got to get a realistic expectation. If they need information in three months, we've got to work with that. If they can allow two years, three years, we can work with that. But we have to get on the same page about how long this is going to take. And that happens in the pre-evaluation uh, process. Process. And it increases the likelihood of use in the end if they're engaged on the same page and buying in. The third thing, as I mentioned earlier, we can't forget, and I, I'm sure all of you already agree and know, is that messages have to be simple, compelling, and salient, and that if you're finding your leadership and, and the uh, political climate is not in agreement, then do homework. There's always diversity in public opinion. Find potential leaders and drop back and try to reach them first. Then there are what I call the P's of politics and, in fact, of good evaluation use. Those P's include perseverance and patience because, as you know, this does take time. Change isn't immediate. Just because we finished an impact evaluation doesn't mean it's going to have impact immediately. Those program managers have been working for change in that area for decades. And certainly one study isn't going to change it overnight. It may be having use, but it may not change it. So you've got to be persistent and patient and persevere. Never give up. Change may, you may be struggling and struggling, and what I've seen all too often is that you're about to give up, and the next day there's a breakthrough. So, so never give up. 
Um, there has to be passion. You either have to have a deeply felt need for the topic you're evaluating, and it was so easy for me in, the, in, in my 30-year career in AIDS because I was so um, invested in that area, um, or you have to have a passion in evaluation. Our group right now for the past three and a half years, we evaluate 34 programs. We aren't necessarily expert or passionate in every single topic, but the group is passionate about evaluation. So you have to have a passion to keep you focused. And passion does not lead to a conflict of interest or bias necessarily. We work, very, we're an independent evaluation office using the highest of standards. You can have passion and still do quality, credible, evidence-based research. Next, we have to be perceptive, perceptive about context and what people are really thinking and need in order to make a difference and to be able to see any change. We have to appreciate both our constituents um, and the, the uh, parties we're trying to change as well as the politicians' uh, uh, needs for information to make a difference. Next, we have to have that persuasive policy or position paper, that brief communication that includes a synthesis of what does the literature say on this, what did my findings, uh, what did my study say on this? Simply, what am I recommending and how might you go about it? In a couple of pages, two or three pages, don't go beyond the evidence, but package it different with, uh, put on the, the glasses of the consumer, the politician or program manager, how would they like to see this data? And then finally, an interesting thing I found is there's a huge appetite for peer-to-peer -peer learning. Now, we think of peer-to-peer -peer education when we're doing community outreach or trying to get people to learn better in some program effort. But I'm talking actually about peer-to-peer -peer education among politicians, among policymakers, among program executives and managers. Because what I've seen actually, and I've watched now up close and personal, is politicians are always talking to each other, always sharing ideas and communicating and forming allies. And there really is a value in understanding from someone who's walked in your shoes, who's in a country that just faced a national AIDS policy that got shot down and you're trying to do the same thing. Um, so there's value and rather than hearing from an evaluator standing up and reading the results or sending the report, they don't really want to listen to you. I mean, certainly wouldn't listen this long. They might give you three minutes. So, but if, if a politician was standing up here and talking, uh, they would be listening. So look for those opportunities, facilitate those opportunities. Maybe that is something 3IE could do. Facilitate more peer-to-peer -peer exchange um, and debates among our political uh, and program colleagues. Um, and Tan, uh, I've been thinking about this one a lot, and it's that use is not a homogenous concept, and it's not to be understood just from the eyes or lens of an evaluator. Use is a very dynamic thing, and it really needs to be best understood on the other side of the equation, from the eyes of a policymaker, um, a politician, or a program manager. Because use, and we have to unpack this notion of use. I mean, we are lamenting for decades our evaluations aren't used. But we say that as evaluators, lamenting to each other. Um, use, and I think we're too hard on ourselves, frankly. I really do. I think use is a huge continuum that begins as soon as someone hears about the results, starts thinking about those results, maybe internalizes those results, starts developing plans, taking initial action, maybe implementing a, a modest program, and then hopefully eventually having impact that, that actually makes a difference in the lives of the people we're trying to serve. So let's give ourselves credit and not be so naive or even arrogant to think our evaluation report should cause these differences in the long-term outcome impact, and if they didn't, it's not use. It is, it is still being used even if we don't get that far, and we won't get that far actually without these initial um, steps being taken. Um, so uh, 11 is that, again, when there's difficult national change, many times we're trying to change a country or a national government or a whole system, we need to take a more granular approach. Drop back, do some homework, and go after like-minded leaders or states or provinces or districts or the community planning groups and let it come from the grassroots up. And finally, the quid pro quo mindset. I think this really, really helps. If evaluators go in thinking, okay, I need to know these things, um, our studies are gonna ask these questions, but when you talk to policymakers or program managers, they say, well, we'd really also like to know this and this. If you can manage to do it, do it. Add those extra questions or expand it a little bit because in doing so, you get and you give. And I can't uh, con um, stress that enough. So in conclusion, the two things I'd like to ask for uh, 3IE to do 
I'd like uh, 3IE grants for impact evaluation to always fund a translation, dissemination, and uptake phase. That, it's that you become a model for all funders of evaluation, that we don't just end with the re final report coming in. That all evaluation has this translation phase where the evaluators, and maybe if they can't do it themselves, there's a consultant or someone in, in the program coming on that works to, to develop this bridge. That that's always a phase, a part of all evaluations. Otherwise, frankly, why do an evaluation? I mean, who wants to do an evaluation that's just on a shelf? If you're in academia, okay, you get a publication, but in evaluation, why do you want an evaluation that's just sitting on the shelf? Clearly evaluators, I believe, want to make a difference. And then the second thing that's dear to my heart is I think we, I would like to ask 3IU to do a better job training the next um, uh, generation of evaluators to get skills in these areas, these people skills, these advocacy skills, these strategic leadership skills, so that evaluators in the next generation, and the ones I talk to, I have a whole colleague, a whole cohort of 30-somethings, they want to do this. They want to have this uh, training. And I've been at it 35 years and learning these insights, and I, I don't think it takes that long. I think they're learnable skills. I think they're trainable, and so I think we need to develop a curriculum now that really supplements that and delivers effectively to the next generation how to start doing this much earlier so that we create the, um, the leaders, that evaluations become the strategic leaders in changing uh, and supporting the changes in, in this global environment. And I will stop there, and uh, sorry for going a bit long. I get passionate about this, as you can see, and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.